Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the sentencing of Elizabeth Holmes? At the time making this video, her sentencing is coming up in a few days. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of Elizabeth Holmes. I'll look at a motion filed by her attorneys where they argue that her sentence should be light. Then I'll offer my analysis. Elizabeth Holmes was born in Washington, D.C. on February 3, 1984. Her father worked for the EPA, the State Department, and other places. Her mother was a Congressional Committee staffer. Elizabeth was primarily raised in Washington, D.C. and Houston, Texas. She had a younger brother. She went to high school in Texas and developed an interest in computer programming. After graduating, she attended Stanford starting in the fall of 2002, but dropped out in 2004. The year before, Elizabeth started a health technology company in California called Real-Time Cures. The idea behind it was to develop a process for performing tests on small amounts of blood. Her fear of needles was a motivator. Unfortunately for Elizabeth, her idea was largely not feasible. Several professors told her that the idea was impossible, but Elizabeth was not going to let reality get in her way. She changed the name of her company to Theranos. This is supposed to be a combination of the word therapy and the word diagnosis, but I think a more fitting way to think about it would be a combination of Thanos from the Avengers and an ER, like an emergency room. Elizabeth started raising money for her company. By the end of 2010, she had raised over $92 million. A number of her investors were high-profile figures who had experience in investing. Elizabeth hired many professionals and started working on her blood testing technology. But it was difficult to make progress, mostly because of that whole impossible part I mentioned. In 2015, the Wall Street Journal published an article about how a machine developed by Elizabeth's company was giving inaccurate results. After this, the company went downhill quickly. It was sued by the state of Arizona and the Securities and Exchange Commission. Elizabeth settled the lawsuit with the SEC. She was fined half a million dollars and banned from being an officer or director of a public company for 10 years. In June of 2018, Elizabeth and her former lover, Sonny Balwani, were indicted for wire fraud. Prosecutors said that they defrauded investors, physicians, and patients. In 2019, Elizabeth married a man named William Evans. He is the heir to a hotel empire in San Diego. In 2021, Elizabeth Holmes was convicted of wire fraud and conspiracy to commit wire fraud. She was found not guilty of defrauding patients. At the time making this video, Elizabeth faces up to 20 years in prison, although a sentence anywhere near the maximum is very unlikely. On November 10, 2022, Elizabeth's attorneys filed a motion for downward departure, which coincidentally is what happened to money invested in Elizabeth's company. Her attorneys are trying to convince the judge to show leniency to Elizabeth. If she must go to prison, her attorneys recommend 18 months or less, which would be lower than indicated by the sentencing guideline for her convictions. Here are the elements of their argument to the court, like the reasons that Elizabeth should be given a light sentence. Much of this is paraphrased. The motion plus an exhibit were over 360 pages combined. When Elizabeth was in college, she was determined and idealistic. She was allegedly the victim of an assault of a sexual nature. She channeled her anger from that experience into helping others. When Elizabeth was 18, she met 38-year-old Sonny Balwani. He became a trusted advisor and eventually her lover. Elizabeth started her company with no business experience when she was 19 years old, and Sonny was given a leadership position. Sonny allegedly abused, berated, and controlled Elizabeth over the course of several years. He encouraged her to be more masculine. Some people think this is where the deep voice came from. Elizabeth used this voice that seemed deeper than usual, although her family said that she always had that voice. 
Elizabeth's assistant said that they could overhear Sonny screaming at Elizabeth in her office. Elizabeth's parents witnessed Sonny criticizing and yelling at Elizabeth, in addition to other behavior that made them uncomfortable. Text messages between Elizabeth and Sonny feature expressions of love, apologies, and attempts to appease. What Elizabeth's attorneys are essentially saying here is that Sonny's alleged manipulation fit into a well-known pattern. As the relationship with Sonny progressed, Elizabeth became more distant from her family. She trusted Sonny completely and was determined to follow his advice. In addition to being in a position of power over Elizabeth, Sonny was in a position of power in the company. Despite the stress of this relationship, Elizabeth attempted to be a good leader. For example, she responded to criticisms and tried to fix problems in the company. She hired people with advanced degrees and took their advice. At one point, the board of directors performed an audit and said there was no evidence of fraud. Elizabeth had been misunderstood by the public and the media. Over 130 people who knew Elizabeth wrote letters to the court. Just a few examples of their descriptions of Elizabeth. She is compassionate, a devoted mother, enthusiastic, ambitious, humble, genuine, selfless, approachable, attentive, ethical, warm, hardworking, a problem solver, a mentor to young women, a good listener, driven to make the world a better place. She has the capacity to redeem herself and is extremely intelligent. Elizabeth did not create her company with any nefarious intent. She wanted to help people and was not interested in money. She did not personally profit from the money of investors. Rather, the funds were always used to pay for operations, as well as research and development. Elizabeth never sold her stock, despite having had many opportunities to do so. She actually gave up some ownership of the company in an effort to save it, and voluntarily gave investors a portion of her shares. Elizabeth will be punished for the rest of her life, regardless of her sentence, due to the publicity in this case. As far as the investors who were defrauded, they were sophisticated and understood that they were investing in a company that would probably fail. The investors should have realized that 7 out of 10 businesses like this will shut down. Moving to the possible prison sentence, Elizabeth's attorneys argued that incarceration is not necessary to protect the public, to function as a general deterrent, or to function as a specific deterrent to Elizabeth. She does not pose a danger to anyone. She acknowledged her mistakes and shows remorse. Obviously, the prosecution disagrees with the idea of a lenient sentence. They would like Elizabeth to enjoy prison for 15 years. The government argued that Elizabeth deserves this for a few reasons. She forged her own endorsements, preyed on the hopes of investors, was deceptive, attacked journalists who dared question the viability of her company's technology, misrepresented her company's progress to everyone, recklessly brought unproven technology to market, and played the victim. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one, Elizabeth wants the court to believe that she was being manipulated by her lover. Sonny allegedly demanded that Elizabeth refrain from drinking alcohol, limit her food intake, sleep according to a strict schedule, and pretend to have a certain personality style. Every behavior for which Elizabeth can be criticized can be magically explained by Sonny. Sonny called Elizabeth's claims false and inflammatory, so he denies what she's saying. It's quite possible that Sonny was not a great partner, but it's hard to believe that he was a puppet master, pulling all the strings and making Elizabeth commit crimes. Elizabeth took definitive steps to defraud investors. She did not appear to be someone who was acting under duress. Her actions were far too calculated and precise. Item number two, the motion for a downward departure from sentencing guidelines strongly emphasized how Elizabeth was a great person who was well-liked by everybody in the world, or at least by over 130 people. Elizabeth made a positive impression on many people throughout her life. This seems inconsistent with the fact that she committed major crimes. How could these two elements coexist? I think this could be explained by grandiose narcissism. Elizabeth was not primarily interested in money. Rather, she wanted to be recognized as a person who changed the world. She wanted to be recognized for being 
great. Elizabeth was grandiose, charismatic, manipulative, believed herself to be special, had a sense of entitlement, and had incredible fantasies of fame, success, and power. Her self-confidence and enthusiasm made other people excited. Therefore, they viewed her positively. Because Elizabeth didn't seem to be interested in money, she did not appear to be greedy. This helped her to impress people. In addition, Elizabeth had such a strong belief that she was special, she made other people feel special simply for knowing her. Everything she did was self-centered, but Elizabeth had a way of making other people live vicariously through her. In a sense, her narcissism was contagious. Item number three, there is a theme of victimhood in the statements made by Elizabeth's attorneys. Elizabeth wants the court to believe that she was driven to commit crimes because she was a victim. She was a victim in college. She was a victim of Sonny. She was the victim of people she hired to protect a company. Elizabeth believes that the public and the media have incorrectly assessed her. She is not really robotic and devoid of emotions. Rather, she just put on a stoic face for the public. In reality, she is full of love, empathy, kindness, and grace. Another theme here is that everybody failed but Elizabeth. I find it curious that her story was never about being a victim until she was indicted for victimizing others. Item number four. Like many self-proclaimed visionaries, Elizabeth had a distinct and noticeable image, but no substance. Some people have called her extremely intelligent. One of her references said that she was the most intelligent person they had ever met, which means they need to get out more and meet some other people. I think Elizabeth's level of intelligence is probably above average, but there's not much evidence to support the idea that she is extremely intelligent. For example, she had hardly any understanding of the science behind the products her company was trying to create. When confronted about her lack of comprehension, Elizabeth would emphasize her family history. Her great-great-grandfather was a surgeon, and her great-great-great-grandfather founded a yeast company. So-called visionaries love to think of themselves as smarter than everyone else, but usually the characteristics that stand out in them are charisma and enthusiasm. Elizabeth believed herself to be a disruptor. In one sense, she was right. She disrupted investors from hanging on to their money. She was able to impress high-profile and wealthy people with just eagerness and passion. Item number five. What personality characteristics could explain the behavior of Elizabeth Holmes? This is just a theory, my opinion. Elizabeth's behavior appears to be consistent with a dark triad. This refers to subclinical levels of psychopathy, narcissism, and Machiavellianism, which are extremely common in business leaders. Some would argue that these traits are helpful for leaders. Her lack of empathy and failure to take responsibility could be related to psychopathy, I've talked about her narcissism, like the grandiosity and the sense of entitlement. Elizabeth thought that she was destined to revolutionize the entire world and change humanity forever. As far as the Machiavellianism, Elizabeth had a long-term strategy, was goal-oriented, and she was willing to delay gratification. She believed that the ends justified the means. She wasn't going to let anything stand in her way. Item number six. What should Elizabeth's sentence be? I generally don't think it's a great idea to send people who commit property crimes to prison, but of course there are exceptions. One exception would be if a person steals a lot of money. Looking at the charges of which Elizabeth was convicted, they involved the transferring of $140 million. In addition, what she did was reckless and could have endangered the public. I think the sentence needs to be long enough to communicate to Elizabeth that everyone knows that she was responsible for the fraud. I would say somewhere around five years in prison would be fair. Experts on sentencing say that Elizabeth probably won't even get three years in prison. The problem with a light sentence in this case is that it only encourages offenders to blame others and play the victim. If she really is generous, empathic, charitable, kind, and genuine, then she should desire to spend several years in prison. Elizabeth should be racked by guilt and want to pay her debt to society. 
I think it's important that the court grant her this incredible opportunity to make amends. Now moving to my final thoughts. Some people are so driven to achieve unrealistic goals that they drag others into their fantasy. They affect other people with toxic idealism. Form without substance may look appealing, but it has no actual value. Elizabeth Holmes was largely incompetent and unskilled, but she did know how to deceive people. She did this one thing so well, no one cared if she was competent or not. Those are my thoughts on the sentencing of Elizabeth Holmes. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be as intriguing as Thanos walking into an ER and coming up with a master plan to defraud the world. Thanks for watching.